Hello there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Welcome to Secrets of Organ Playing podcast number 115. Today is Sunday, October 8th, 2017. And today's guest is a young and talented American organist, Caitlin Emerson who is praised for her great sensitivity and exciting artistry. And her repertoire ranges from the 14th to 21st centuries in performances throughout North America and Europe. I can list here many illustrious locations where she played or will be playing, but the list is just enormous. For example, Walt Disney Hall, Los Angeles, the famous Hal Grimskirche in Iceland, American Cathedral in Paris, and many, many others. As first prize winner of the AGO's 2016 National Young Artist Competition in Organ Performance, the Guild's premier performance competition, Caitlin will be honored with a recital at the 2018 National Convention of the AGO in Kansas City, Missouri, and released her first recording, Evocations, under the Pro Organo label in spring 2000. 17. Uh, Caitlin also received many prestigious uh, awards, scholarships, and grants, most notably a uh, Fulbright Study Research Grant, because of which Caitlin studied at the Regional Conservatory in Toulouse, France, uh, for the 2015 16 academic year with Michel Bouvard, Jan Willem Janssen, and Yasuko Uyama Bouvard. In May 2015, she graduated from Oberlin College and Conservatory with a double bachelor's degree in organ performance and French, as well as with minors in music history and historical performance on fortepiano. Caitlin's North American appearances are managed by Karen McFarlane Artists at ConcertOrganist.com. You can read about her achievements in great detail in the description of this podcast conversation. In addition to her travels, performances, and teaching, Caitlin is associate organist and choir master at the Church of the Advent in Boston, Massachusetts, where she works with the historic Aeolian Skinner organ, the professional choir of the Church of the Advent, and the volunteer parish choir. In this conversation, Caitlin shares her insights on uh, dealing with wrist pain, panic attacks, and uh, unpredictability of rehearsals before public performances. If you want to find out more about her fantastic uh, organ career, visit uh, CaitlinEmerson.com. And now let's go to the show. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for uh, joining uh, me in this conversation from uh, the distant country of America. And we are so far away, like seven hours apart, but we share a common purpose, common passion, uh, pipe organ, right? Thank you so much. We, Absolutely. We, I think we'll be having a wonderful time talking about your your uh, uh, projects that you're currently working on, uh, basically challenges that you have to overcome and uh, things like that. And uh, thank you so much. You're very generous and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So, Caitlin, for starters, would you uh, share with us a story uh, when you first uh, fell in love with the organ? Uh, it's very interesting to go back in time and remember those things. It certainly is, because we all come to it through such a different way. I came to the pipe organ um, fairly directly. I had attended church throughout my life, and my parents still attend one of the churches in which I grew up. But I didn't actually come to the pipe organ through church. I came to it through choir. I was in the Seacoast Children's Chorus in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which is about 20 minutes from my home in Maine. And um, I was under the direction of Diane Dean in this choir, and she was on the board for this young organist collaborative that began in 2001 that offers free lessons for students just wanting to start the pipe organ. And knowing that I played the flute, the piano, that I sang, and was rather a glutton for all things musical, 
um, she suggested that I apply for this scholarship and I did receive it. And um, my mother used to require that I practice for exactly the same amount, at least, that it took us to drive to the church. So that meant I had to practice for 40 minutes every day. And that was enough to get me started and to see myself having progress. And then I caught the bug, more or less, of making music through the organ. And why did you choose the organ? What was so special about this instrument? I remember that um, everybody, all of my teachers for each instrument were trying to pull me in the direction of pursuing their instruments professionally in the most gentle and well-mannered way as possible. You know, the flute teacher really was encouraging me to look at that. My piano teacher, I recall that at one point, you know, in the middle of a recital, she jokingly made me promise that I'd pursue piano but it was actually when I was playing flute in the Portland Youth Symphony Orchestra, we were doing the Saison Symphony. And the first time we ever performed it with the organ was at the concert because there was just such limited time. And of course, when the organ comes in on those big, big C major chords, me being the, you know, flutist that I was, the diva that I was, that was, that was it. I was going to be the instrument that could utterly drown out a youth orchestra. <laughs> Wonderful. So big sounds uh, really fascinated you, right? and captivated your big attention. Sounds. Mm -hmm. The big sounds, the variety of timbres, really, before I even knew really what a timbre was. It was the fact that it could be all of these instruments in one at the same time and could translate emotion, power, sensitivity, all through a single instrument, through the touch of a finger. Did you, uh, did you recognize, for example, some flute sounds because you were playing flute at the time? Uh, or, or was it... Uh, sort of a just variety of colors. It was really the variety. I've never been somebody who did very well if I was bored. I, I had, you know, four instruments going as well as school, as well as everything else. So the fact that I could do so much with it, that there was such a mechanical aspect as well as a musical aspect meant that I was able to be challenged in so many different ways that it kept my attention um, far longer than I ever would have expected. Yeah, it's it's uh, this magnificence of this queen of instruments, or or uh, maybe king of instruments, as in English. Uh, it's really f fascinating for a lot of organists at at start, right? Uh, sometimes they are captivated exactly. by the grandeur of of colors, as you say, and sometimes uh, by the mysteries of the mechanics, how the sound is produced. By the way. Uh, the yeah. insight of the organ, how interesting uh, for you was at that time, the mechanics of the organ? It intimidated me hugely because while I knew how to maintain my flute, while I knew how to tune a piano, I knew how the action worked. The organ just was a petrifying concept. You know, it's so huge. H1 is so different. You have mechanical, you have electro-pneumatic, you have electric, you have such a variety of different ways that the instrument is put together that I, I thought I would never really understand it. And I'm still working on it. Um, I, I'm constantly discovering new things through meeting organ builders, through meeting people whose passion is really the, the mechanical aspects of the instrument. And e everything I learn is, you know, it opens new doors to show how much I don't know. So it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I think you have to stay curious, right? All the time and keep learning every day keep learning new exactly. things exactly which we which we all should be anyway no matter what we do <laughs> exactly um so uh, what happened next uh, how did you basically started playing uh, organ more or less uh, professionally um i decided on the organ eventually. I think I must have been 16 or 17 when I thought, well, maybe I'll pursue this instrument. And I applied to universities and was fortunate to be accepted and um, attend Oberlin College and Conservatory in Ohio, where I always joke that there's little to do but practice because you're in the middle of cornfields. So it's a beautiful campus and they have a fabulous little art school as well. So I pursued um, both French and organ majors. And at the end of my freshman year, I won the regional competition for young organists and that kind of jump-started me concertizing um, around a dozen concerts a year. So I was able to do that while maintaining school and everything and traveling. So I really started getting the bug for for sharing music in a totally different way on a more regular schedule. So that was th quite thrilling. Fantastic. Um, you know, having uh, this environment of constant practice and as you say, having uh, a lot of uh, 
um, free time but in your hands but basically be able to practice all the time and to, and to having people around you who are also constantly practicing this is a perfect environment to grow isn't it it is you're with your colleagues or people your friends who will become your colleagues and you're all egging each other on hopefully in the most positive of ways and you're hearing all of this music that you would never hear if you were just sitting by yourself in one's room so i was so fortunate to have such fabulous colleagues such amazing teachers and to have the amazing resources that oberlin has for practicing as you say to be able to practice all the time i think we had about 20 organ majors and we had 17 practice organs. So you don't quite realize how spoiled you are with that until you go out into the real world and are faced with the prospect of not being able to practice whenever you want. It's, it's a little bit odd in a way to have that realization. I remember my professor, Pamela Reuter Finstra, she was teaching at Eastern Michigan University at the time. And uh, my wife, Oshra, and I, uh, and a few other students, I think, from Pamela's studio went together in her uh, Volvo, I think, uh, to the Oberlin Organ Conference. And yes. we were fascinated by the number of uh, instruments uh, they have uh, at their disposal on campus. So what was your favorite instrument uh, back then? There's no question that it was the Brumbau that we have in Fairchild Chapel, which is the mean tone organ with split sharp keys. It's just, it, you can completely escape into the oak principle for hours upon end. It's just beautiful and it teaches you so much about touch. And actually, um, I studied with your teacher, Pamela Reuter Feenstra, when I was at a pipe organ encounter. She was teaching organ improvisation and she yeah. taught us so much about touch as well. Yeah, she's such a fabulous teacher. I'll it's make sure. Wonderful, but the, to this conversation and say, say hello to you too. She Absolutely, I would love that. Wonderful. <laughs> she may not, I think I, yes. We meet so many friends online and offline and, and this little community that we have uh, of organists around the world is so fascinating because really somebody, sometimes somebody knows somebody and can direct you uh, to, to further acquaintances and uh, it's really amazing to grow your uh, friendships this way. The community is just incredibly supportive. I've been so grateful throughout all of my experiences. It's just incredible, as you say. Caitlin, uh, what was your, the most challenging moment uh, in the, your organist career? Do you remember the darkest hour, the uh, hopeless hour you had on the instrument, at the instrument? Well, I think um, one of the biggest challenges I have faced was actually during university, switching from being the precocious teenager who just loved music to becoming the professional who needed to play music. I think that was a very difficult transition to make, um, to still enjoy it, but realize that it, it was also a necessity. I struggled very much with performance anxiety when I was around a sophomore, junior in college. And I'm, I still work on that regularly, although performing um, as much as possible has really helped me to just maintain it and to reprogram it in a way in my mind. But I was reading lots of books on the subject and they weren't helping and I was performing and nervous and every mistake seemed like the end of the world. So that was probably the biggest challenge that I still work on. The other thing was when I was 14, I had just started playing the organ a year before and I was as a precocious 14 year old does playing the Moonlight Sonata. And I have very small hands, so I probably shouldn't have been doing that. I shouldn't have been lifting my backpack the way I was. Um, I developed tendonitis in both wrists. And that re required me essentially stopping playing piano for two years and relearning technique, changing teachers, practicing um, arm weight, practicing not stretching, practicing going back into neutral positions as frequently as possible, and ensuring that I was playing the most efficient way so that I would not have to completely stop playing permanently. So that was an eye-opening experience at that age to be facing the possibility of no longer being able to play piano or organ just because my body couldn't handle it. So I was very fortunate to move through that. And now when I teach, I can see if there are problems developing. I'm very open with my students about ergonomic ways to deal with such issues. And I'm always looking for ways to be better with my own technique as well. 
So, Caitlin, Caitlin um, let's discuss this a little bit uh, further in detail. Uh, you were playing Moonlight Sonata, right? Uh, which the movement? Last movement. Like, the third the movement. Last? There's all those going, octaves. <laughs> I was going to say the first movement wouldn't be so strenuous, no? No, and neither the second. <laughs> Uh, and of course, people always want to play the first movement, not the third oh. one. Yes, but of course, I had to play the third movement. I was precocious. <laughs> so that was... Uh, what yeah. happened? How did you first became, become aware that you had the pain in your wrist? I just began having pains all down my forearms. And um, I had swelling. My mother is an occupational therapist with a specialty in upper extremities. So the minute I started complaining about pain, she started looking at what I was doing. She started looking and finding swelling in my forearms. And fortunately, she caught it early enough and said, we need to change something. And I had her constantly reminding me, are you relaxing? Are you lifting things the wrong way? Are you, you know, what are you doing that's causing it? Because we, we assume the injuries come from our music because we're practicing for several hours a day. But mm -hmm. frequently they come from typing at a computer. They come from terrible posture at the computer. They come from, I was lifting at my backpack with my wrist, just taking it in my hand and bending my wrist to lift it up. Now I always put it on my forearm and pick it up that way with my elbow using a larger muscle so that I'm not twanging the tiny muscles that are in your forearm and thus hurting the wrist. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we think it's always just one source, but really it's a combination of sources that cause these huge issues in our playing, in our way of life. So it was really become aware of that as well. So you mentioned pain. Was it a sudden revelation or a gradual? Like uh, maybe you, you became aware uh, like, like suddenly after one afternoon practice or did you, did you start to develop this pain over a number of weeks? It's a dull ache. It just began as a dull ache and then it worsened. And um, thankfully, I had done enough gymnastics and those sorts of things to determine if it's a muscle pain or a terrible pain. Um, because muscular pain, you know, you lift boxes to help a friend move or, you know, you push something around for a day and you, we all know how that feels. But there's a different kind of chronic ache that develops, a different kind of swelling, a different kind of, oh, my hand, my hand isn't functioning the way it should. And it's not going away in 72 hours. It's, it's really distinguishing me between those two and then realizing when I was practicing that it would start to hurt after 15 or 20 minutes. And that shouldn't happen ever. Um, so learning also that helped me to learn that even when I'm practicing now, if my hands get tired or if I have any kind of pain, I immediately stop, figure out what's going on or just take a break and then come back because we so have to be so self-aware. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, what was, was it for you the reason? Did you... Did you move uh, different uh, muscle groups uh, in the wrong way? Or did you practice without breaks for a long period of time? Did you forget to breathe and relax? What was the reason for, for having those pains at first? I can tell you have experience with these things because you ask all the right questions. Um, mm -hmm. I had technique issues where my thumb was not um, being as ergonomic as economical as possible. So my piano teacher had me working on scales, moving slowly up and down. She had me working on my pinkies, actually developing the muscle on the very end of your pinky. I essentially would just pop my pinky right out of the, right out of the joint every time I would play. So I wasn't being terribly efficient there and there was some tension going on. My wrists were not in the right position. My mother actually ended up making me a split so that my wrists would stay neutral and not add tension there. And, uh, my piano teacher also worked on me doing smooth arm movements so that, for example, when you're playing a C major scale, if you watch a child play, you'll see the minute they have to put that, that um, thumb on the F, they move their entire arm suddenly. So my teacher, my piano teacher had me moving my arm smoothly so that there was never any jerking motion because that means that you're always prepared, always prepared for the next movement and it's incredibly mm -hmm. efficient. You know, uh, I also had a similar experience uh, with my little pinky finger um, when I was playing Scrab in Sonata back in uh, high school, I think. Uh, my piano teacher uh, gave this beautiful sonata with large chords and I, you know, made large sounds and banged the, 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 the piano the, the wrong way, basically. Probably made a lot of stress on my little finger. 
And what happened was that I couldn't play with my right hand anymore for, for six months. And my piano teacher had me play etudes with the left hand only. So that compensated a little bit. I still oh. finished the, the, the grade and, the, and got, uh, you know, pa passed to, to the next level. But, uh, but I didn't use the right hand. So <laughs> what, what did you do uh, when you couldn't play? with those uh, hands what did you do at that time i played very easy music but actually the organ didn't give me pain it was piano mm -hmm. for some reason so that also switched me immediately over to the organ in some ways and so i could work technique solely on the piano so my piano teacher would have me just put you know my middle finger on the organ or on the piano keyboard and just relax my wrist and just you know wag my arm around just to make sure I was relaxed while holding the key. But then I could play organ repertoire and then I could play flute and I could sing. So it wasn't as though I was missing music in my life. And the fact that I had those other instruments actually allowed me to fix the technique and not hurt myself in the process. The famous uh, legendary organist and composer, uh, Marcel Dupré, remember when he was uh, a child, this was a real true story. Uh, he he almost broke his wrist, I think, uh, or one one of his wrists uh, with the glass cut 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 his wrist, and this was extremely dangerous because it was like a few millimeters away from real real um, from the artery situation. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so for several months, for three four months, he couldn't play the organ with mm -hmm. his hands. So what he did at that time was, of course to perfect his pedal technique with mm -hmm. vengeance uh, in his memoirs. He played pedals with vengeance, those pedal scales and arpeggios. Mm -hmm. And that's why he developed this perfect pedal technique. Exactly. So you find ways to get better. It's not just the hands. <laughs> no, no. So it, it's good that that sometimes you, you, you get this, uh, you find this way around the problem, right? And you still continue to, to practice. Yes. Some, some people, I think, can practice on the table just looking at the score, right? Yes. In practice without even touching the keyboard or even moving a finger. That is account. essential. It's essential. It's such, it's such discipline to be able to sit on a train and practice your Dupre. You know, our, our body is connected to our minds. Yes, we need to work up the muscle strength, but actually when we're learning, it's more mental than physical. Muscle memory plays a part, but you're actually training your mind to tell your muscles what to do. Mm -hmm. So realizing that there are other ways to practice, you can sit there and theoretically analyze. Really, we shouldn't be at the keyboard much more than maybe two to four hours a day. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're doing things that we could easily do at a desk. Mm -hmm. Do you... Do you apply this famous Pomodoro technique uh, where you practice for 25 minutes and then fi five minute breaks, 25 minutes of practice and then five minute break and so forth? This is no, no, I'm very good at preaching what I should do and not doing it. <laughs> I can get into phases where I'll practice for four to six hours straight and then... Right. Um, yeah, but usually my limit's about four hours because by four hours, I ne probably need to eat lunch. And the minute that happens, everything stops. <laughs> I know. What is, what is important? Pomodoro timer, you know, this kitchen timer you have, and mm -hmm. you, can, you can set it on uh, 25 minutes. And there are apps like this uh, on the sure. phone. You can do mm -hmm. On the desktop computer too, you could set your timer uh, at uh, 25 minutes and it beeps after that. Sure. And the moment it beeps, you know you have to take a five-minute break. Sure. And something else, move around, take a, take a walk, stretch, breathe, uh, whatever, you know, like drink a glass of uh, water. Yeah, it's very important. And then, and then you come back uh, when... And timer beeps one more time sure. for you to for another session of 25 minutes. Do you do that? Yeah, I do that uh, not only with, with organ, but also with writing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, it helps because writing is also very immersive. You can forget what you're doing and keep typing for hours. Yes. Right? Because you just keep flowing. But it's not always good to, to do this without break. Right, not healthy for your eyes, not healthy for your wrists, mm -hmm. not healthy 
problem for your back unless no. you are maybe on the standing uh, ergonomic uh, desk, mm -hmm. you know, when they do this. Do you, so, do you find that sometimes the timer interrupts a train of thought? Of course, it always okay. does. Okay. <laughs> but when, but it's just five minutes. Yes, you okay. do something very active physically and you come back and the, in those five minutes of break, train of thought uh, maybe comes back to you in, mm -hmm. uh, in 30 seconds or so. And you, mm -hmm. then you go and keep going. You have to get mm -hmm. used to the, you know, interruptions of, uh, of beeping and timers. But I think it's good, mm -hmm. a good uh, way of practicing without ever getting tired. Mm. Mm. I'll have to try that. Pomodoro timer. Great. Uh, you can okay. even Google the, the, the name Pomodoro Technique. Uh, I think mm -hmm. I, I first came across with this term when I've read a book about how to write, you know, book very fast, how to write a book in 25, 21 days. You know, you have yes. to have, of course, good outline, good uh, research and write what you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and then the, the, the key is of course, concentrated effort in those 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, so of course, this helps. So, Caitlin, it's so fascinating. I'll let you know. <laughs> your wrist pain, uh, painful wrists, which you, of course, uh, managed to heal in two years or so. What happened with your performance anxiety? How did you overcome this challenge? It's a constant battle. Um, it's a mental game with oneself. One major thing that I've done is. I convince myself somehow that the nerves are not nerves, they're excitement. And the minute that you redefine this feeling of elevated heart rate, of um, shallower breathing, of any kind of tension as excitement in lieu of nerves, it becomes a positive thing. And it reminds me what I'm there for. It, I'm there to share music. And so I get excited to share music, which also means by the end of the concert, I'm not exhausted from being nervous. I'm exhilarated from the excitement of having exchanged this music, of having um, felt the energy of the audience and shared some emotional journey with them. So it, it redefines it for me. And some concerts, I get incredibly nervous, but then I try, I keep telling myself to redefine it. And that's been the most helpful thing for me. Mm -hmm. Just recreating in my mind the definition. So it's a constant battle with yourself too, right? Every minute of It is, it's a mental game. Oddly, to... once I'm actually performing, it's not an issue. Uh -huh. once, once I'm actually on stage, once I'm, once I'm in the process of doing it, you forget. You, you know why you're there. It's the waiting period prior to the performance during which, you know, the time is passing too slowly. You're just waiting for, you know, people to get seated or something like that. That's the hardest time. You know, yeah, you can't control anything at that point. And it's so, so strange. You even feel guilty of that feeling, yes? of this of this performance. absolutely yes because people, people are just there to enjoy yeah. no you, nobody wishes you badly in a performance you feel sort of very uh, vulnerable right because if something goes wrong people will get uh, maybe uh, um, frustrated with your performance and want to leave right before the the concert ends and maybe your reputation will be ruined. So you feel the risk and, and the stakes are really high. Mm -hmm. But putting that kind of pressure on yourself doesn't help, right? You know, reminding yourself of that, that's uncontrollable self-talk that you can't, you, you can't jump out of the hole once you've started digging it. You have to tell yourself, you have to remind yourself that nobody is sitting there with a scorecard. Nobody is sitting there waiting for the wrong note. They're all sitting there waiting to be, um, they're waiting to be taken away. They're waiting to be brought on a journey. And you're the one who is fortunate enough to be the medium for that journey. So I try to remember that it's, it's not about me. It's more about the audience than it is any, anything else. It's more about me interpreting, showing how I feel at the time than it is about me as an identity, as a person. So it's about really uh, for performance, yeah. 
And that's why we do it, yes, Caitlin, because we don't play it only for ourselves. We play it for, for other people who come to enjoy this. And uh, I think uh, it's okay to feel this anxiety a little bit, right? This stress, this elevates our heartbeat a little bit and uh, we get uh, excited. And this is okay. This is good. Uh, we cannot avoid, avoid this, right? But uh, those panic attacks, that's what is uh, very painful. Yes, and sometimes uncontrollable. You know, panic attacks, it's, it's a psychological response to a stress. And if I get panic attacks, they're never in front of a, they're never before a performance. They're usually afterwards. And it's because all of the stress has just built up. It's built up and built up, and I haven't noticed it. It's like a boiling pot where it hasn't overboiled yet. And then all of a sudden you have the panic attack and everything calms down. <laughs> so sometimes but, panic attacks can actually be a way to release stress. It's so interesting what you're saying. I would think that panic attack usually comes before the performance, right? When you feel so vulnerable, so basically shaking that you don't know what you're doing. Like um, before improvisation recital, right? You, d you don't even know the music. <laughs> you spontaneously create something and um, you might have this uh, feeling too uh, or or when you're playing uh, a piece from memory without uh, without the score and you don't trust yourself right then it might come this feeling yes. oh i'm not in control anymore right but you're mm -hmm. saying this happens for you after the performance why it happens after very high stress performances. Um, often it's because I have, I have fairly good control over my own reactions and I can rationally talk myself through the feelings, but that doesn't mean the feelings and the adrenaline are not there. So I can externally look as though I'm completely in control and it's all, it's all under the surface and it doesn't affect the performance at all. But then afterwards I have to release the stress in some way. So sometimes it'll sneak up on me and I'll just have one of these panic attacks and I know how to control them. Um, but you know, it's, it's an emotional release. It's like some people get emotional release through crying. Some people get it through screaming into a pillow, you know, it's about finding out your own, your body's necessary ways of dealing with these high stress situations, performing in front of a few thousand people, realizing that you're the one in the center of attention. Um, it, it's, it's very high stress on the body, on the mind. And it's about figuring how best to healthily release the stress that your mind and body are both under. Fantastic ex explanation. I couldn't put uh, better uh, how you felt and how you feel about this panic attack. And I'm so glad you can control it. Me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Work in progress. Work in progress. Good. Uh, so you mentioned those two things that are challenging for you or were challenging for you at, at some point. Is there any one more thing, the third thing that you could share with us today? I think the, the third thing would only just be um, comical moments of rehearsals. You know, when you arrive somewhere and you're not sure how much time you're going to have to practice, or you suddenly arrive. Um, when I, I did the Tarverdi of competition in Russia in 2013, and I'll never forget arriving around 10 p.m., not knowing when my practice time was and finding my name in Russian on a board nearby and finding out I had 8 a.m. practice time the next day. Um, just moments like that. And even for the night cop competition that was last summer, only having five hours for a 60 minute program. Um, it just, you know, when you end up under these intense amounts of practice time and there comes a point where, okay, we're registered. We've never run the program on the organ and we're just going to play. That's just what's going to happen today. <laughs> there are some well, instruments where you can have 15 or 20 hours of practice time, but other times, not so much. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this Tariverdi of competition that, that you went. Uh, was it in Kaliningrad? It was. So if people don't know where that is, it is it's not part of mainland Russia. It's between Latvia and Lithuania, not too far from you. Not and um, it's this beautiful port city. No, not too far at all. I so enjoyed my first trip to Russia. That was quite something. 
And it was a privilege to be there with Vertar Didiev and um, the, the whole family that it became of competitors, jury members, um, people who came just to watch the competition. It was quite an incredible experience. I was very grateful to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, this jet lag when you, you know, when you fly for fly over from the Atlantic, you get those those uh, six or seven hours of difference, right? And you you arrive, you said uh, late in the evening, and you found out that uh, in a few hours you have to pr uh, practice again. So it always ends up being an experience. <laughs> yeah, how did you deal with, I'm sorry? with this situation? Was it difficult for you well, to? Well the pieces um it wasn't partially because there were there were four people accepted through the american round of the tarverdiev and we all helped each other so i had two registrants who were also american and my goodness they were complete godsends they were just incredible and they were good friends of mine so they we all helped each other register we all helped it helped to listen to balances a little bit we became a team as well as all of the competitors in a way became a team. We weren't competitors anymore. We were just all trying to make the best music we possibly could and help each other to do the same. So that was one of the best parts. And that, that means that jet lag or exhaustion, you know, it happens, but the purpose becomes different. Mm -hmm. um, so I just so enjoyed getting to know these wonderful people and to, uh, to get to know a whole different part of the world and a few mm -hmm. fun instruments as well. Fantastic. Uh, I'm so delighted to hear that competition competitors are basically your friends it's so strange idea right you you go to a strange country and you you prepare to give your best and you know that everyone else will be doing their best it's like uh, like championship like sports right and yes, in sports absolutely a lot of nasty things uh, are, you know uh, you know when nobody is is looking so with the organist, perhaps it's different, right? Nobody stole your music. I hope it's exactly. Well, that would that would just be silly, you know. I I always think the best part about the competition is getting to meet these people, whom I would never meet otherwise necessarily, and have these wonderful experiences. We're all there for the same purpose. None of us are under. I'm not under any kind of naive assumption that we're not competitors. But at the same time, the organ world is too small for us to become enemies in the sense of competitors. There's a competitor, but there's also a sense of colleague there. And we need to be there to support each other, no matter if we're trying to see who is the best on that particular day at that particular time. Because that's the other thing to remember with competitions. It's only measuring the jury's opinion of the competitors on how they played at 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. or 5 p.m. on that particular day. If one competitor got a phone call about some traumatic family event at 3 p.m. And, and competed at 4, they're not going to play as well as they might have had they played at 2. If they had food poisoning, if a, if a jury member had um, an upset stomach right before one competitor played, you never know the factors that go into winning or losing a competition. So. To me, instead of winning or losing a competition, it becomes about making the connections because those will last far longer than any first prize. Wonderful attitude. It will, uh, of course, help any competitor to know that uh, the goal is not necessarily to win, right? The goal is to have a great experience, to give your best, of course. And to play your best. To yes, play to your play best. your best. But the result is not up to you. Never. No. Not in any way. And frankly, I try to think of a jury as audience members. And I use that mindset of I'm sharing music with these people and taking them on some kind of journey when I'm competing as well. Because frankly, jury members, they're having to listen to anywhere between 16 and 20 competitors. My goodness, I can't even imagine how boring that can be at times, how frustrating that can be at times. You know, you're sitting there listening to somebody who's clearly very nervous or somebody who's clearly having an off day. It must be terribly uncomfortable. I would rather get up there and just have them enjoy themselves, even if I don't win, even if they say, well, your program was this, that, or the other thing. If they had any kind of positive experience through my playing, that's what I'm there for. And that's what music is about for me. You have to remember in those competitions where the competitor is visible, it's not blind audition. Uh, of course, mm -hmm. there are subjective feelings of the jury. Sometimes they want to promote uh, 
their student or a student of a colleague uh, of the jury member, right? And those uh, irrational feelings sometimes might upset a competitor, an organist. And uh, we just have to let go of those feelings and to keep playing and keep doing our best and, and uh, release uh, uh, our feelings in another positive way, right? Don't keep the grudge if yes. anything. Exactly, and it's so hard as musicians, we spend hours a day in a church, in a practice room by ourselves, perfecting an art. And if we enter a competition where in 25 minutes, the jury decides whether or not we're worth it or worth first prize, we have to remember that that's not our identity, that 25 minutes worth of performance. It's hard to separate ourselves from that sometimes. So, Caitlin, do you recommend people to go to competitions to check their level of proficiency and professionalism? Yes and no. Um, James David Christie, who is my teacher at Oberlin, he has this saying, never enter a competition that you don't plan to win. So in a way, I, I, I subscribe to that thought process while saying don't enter a competition with only the goal of winning. Enter a competition where you are prepared, where you are of a level where you can win. And then when you get there, play the best you can, but find other reasons to be there as well. That's the mental game I play with myself. You know, I would certainly love to win. It would be nice to get the prize money. It would be all nice to do those sorts of things. But I know myself. And, you know, if I go to a competition and don't win, but think I should have won and didn't get anything else out of it, then I'll be kicking myself for the next two months. And I'd rather not waste time doing that. That doesn't seem worthwhile to me. I'd rather come back and say, no, I didn't win. But look at all these wonderful friends I got out of it. Look at the wonderful experiences I have. So that's the mental game I play with myself. And that, that seems to work for me. I think everybody has to figure out their own way. But for me, entering competitions has been very positive in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for me... I played in, in a number of competitions. Some were successful and some not. And uh, the moment I stopped participating, stopped competing, was very liberating because I understood that when I'm competing and uh, I'm doing my best or not so best, right? Uh, I'm basically giving my my perhaps even my future to somebody else's hands, right? It's and very that's scary. Not the best, the best strategy of a long-term organist career, don't you think? Absolutely. We can't be students for the rest of our lives. We can't be competitors for the rest of our lives. Eventually, we have to find a point where we're our own jury members. We're setting the standards for ourselves, and we're playing to those as often as we possibly can. Even if the bar is continually set higher, we're the ones setting it, and we're the ones determining. We're our own teachers, in a sense. So that's, that's huge. And to, to reach that goal is admirable for any individual because it's very challenging. So Caitlin, uh, tell us a little bit what you're up to right now. What are you working on currently? So I'm currently the Associate Organist and Choir Master at the wonderful Church of the Advent in Boston, where we have a beautiful 1935 Aeolian Skinner organ. And I just recorded a CD on that in January, and that was released in May. Um, in addition to that, I'm under Karen McFarlane management. So I have about 30 to 35 concerts this year. So I'm traveling quite a bit. There was a, um, a two months back in the spring where I was on a plane two to four times a week, which was a very new experience for me. Um, it's been a fabulous ride and I'm looking very much forward to this fall because I'm traveling um, over to Europe. I'm traveling um, down to Florida. To I'm finally flying to the West Coast where I've never been before. So I'm really seeing new parts of the world and that's one of the most exciting things going on for me at the moment. Mm -hmm. So um, how much time do you devote for church service playing and church service work basically, preparation and versus your concert life? I consider myself to be half time on both, although we musicians don't really buy into the American idea of 40 to 60 hours a week. So I'm pretty much working most of the time, but at the same time, I have never worked a day in my life because when we're actually doing something that we enjoy so much, it doesn't feel like work, even if we become tired or, you know, it's the daily grind in a way. And the fact that I, 
I wake up, I go practice repertoire, I work on church accompaniments, I practice hymns, I do payroll for the choir, I um, work on finding substitutes. It, it all becomes mixed up in a way. You know, I'll practice the, the piece I'm premiering in two weeks, but then I'll work on my Howells accompaniment for church service on Sunday. So I practice everything as much as it needs, but I don't really count the hours. Mm -hmm. So, Caitlin, uh, what are you premiering in two weeks? Oh, no, that was just an example. <laughs> no, nothing just yet. I'm working on a few, a few different projects, but okay. I'm, I'm doing my first organ concerto in Wiesbaden in the Kurhaus oh. in November. So that's very exciting. So that's the current project. What piece are you playing with orchestra? The second Guimont Symphony. Second, okay. Mm -hmm. um, which part is your most favorite at this point? Oh, I love that beautiful adagio movement. It's just lovely. Yes, and it's so, the strings just add so much to it. It's, it's heartbreakingly beautiful. Gilma was a master of adagios. And Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Very right. Wonderful. Um, so I'm so glad we connected and we, we had this conversation. Uh, we, we talked about a lot of challenges you overcame uh, over the years, your uh, painful risks, your performance anxiety, which you still are battling every day, every performance, right? And then the shortage of, uh, of, uh, of uh, time for rehearsing, right? And registering the piece or unpredictability of, of rehearsals. When you travel, you don't know how many hours you will get, right? Exactly. Uh, but uh, those things will, of course, make you stronger, right? Every stressful Precisely. situation that you come out of, you have always you come out stronger. Well, and I always joke, if it were easy, then everybody would be doing all the same things. So we each pursue what we're meant to pursue in a way. So thank you so much, Caitlin. You are so, uh, so wonderful and generous and such an inspiration for all of us around the world from 89 countries who are listening to, to us. And um, before we end, could you direct our listeners to a place online where they could visit you and your work and say hello and support you? I would love that. So my website is CaitlinEmerson.com, and that's K-A-T-E-L-Y-N, Emerson, E-M-E-R-S-O-N.com. And actually, there's a contact page there where you can find either my email or contact me through the website. And both of those are a great way to get in touch with me because I'd love to connect with more organists. We're such a wonderful community, and it's so important for us to support each other. Wonderful. Imagine, uh, this is the closing thought. Imagine, Caitlin, you, you could go back in time when you were, uh, let's say, 14 or 16, when you first started playing the organ, right? What would you do differently today? I can't imagine doing anything differently. I'm exactly where I had always hoped to be. So that's, I, I can't even imagine doing anything differently. How fortunate could I be? <laughs> it's just incredible. Caitlin, I ask this question at the end of most conversations. I, and I always get a different kind of answer. I'm but sure. This, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. Thumbs up and thank you so much and let's keep in touch. I look forward to it. You take care. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog Secrets of Organ Playing at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening. And I'll catch you online really soon.